Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the UPSC perspective. Today we have taken up important articles from the Hindu newspaper. Topics which we are going to discuss are displayed on your screen. Let's begin the discussion. Now let's start our discussion with the first article which appeared on page number 4 in the Hindu newspaper. Context of this article is that pro Khalistani slogans were recently raised by supporters and activists of radical Sikh outfits on the 39th anniversary of Operation Blue Star on the Golden Temple premises. Now what is Khalistan issue? Khalistan is a separatist movement which aims to create a nation state which would serve as a homeland for Sikhs in Punjab region of Indian subcontinent. Now the proposed state would consist of land that currently forms Punjab in India and Punjab in Pakistan. Now briefly let us look into the origin of this movement. The call for separate Sikh state began in wake up of the fall of British rule. In 1940, the first explicit call for Khalistan was made in a pamphlet titled Khalistan and it gained momentum after India became independent in 1947. In the same year, Shiromani Akali Dal, that is SAD, led the Punjabi Subha movement and sought to create a new province for the Punjabi people. At best, it wanted a sovereign state that is Khalistan and at worst, it wanted an autonomous state within India. So with this you can make it that Khalistan movement with its call for an independent Sikh state was largely fueled by a sense of regionalism. And as you can see here, regionalism is one of the important theme under GS Paper 1. Also one of the recurring theme in UPSC means examination. As you can see, UPSC has been asking question based on the same. Question based on basis of regionalism came in year 2020. Then 2013, UPSC has asked how regionalism is an important factor in the generation of demand for a separate state. So in crux, this theme is quite important. So here, let us understand the big picture of this particular issue that is regionalism. Now we'll start with what is regionalism. Regionalism means excessive attachment for a particular region or state as against country as whole. Now here what is region means? Region is a territorial unit with dialect, ethnic group, social and cultural institution with widely prevalent sentiment of togetherness. This creates sense of identity which is a real and as dear to a people than their feeling of identity with a state or a nation or a religious group or a linguistic group. This gives rise to the concept of regionalism. Now term regionalism has two connotations, negative and positive. Negative regionalism implies excessive attachment to one's region is preference to country or the state. Why it is negative? Because it can be a great threat to the unity and integrity of the country. On the other side, we have positive sense regionalism. It is a political attribute associated with people's love for their region, culture, language, etc. with a view to maintain their independent identity. Thus, it is a welcome thing as it encourages the people to develop a sense of brotherhood and commonness based on common language, regional, religion or historical background. The best example of negative sense regionalism is Khalistan. Khalistan issue will come under this category and reorganization of southern Indian states based on language will come under this category that is positive sense regionalism. Now let us look into the forms of regionalism. Now first under this category is demand for greater autonomy. Now regionalism has often led to the demand by states for greater autonomy from the center. Why? Because increasing interference by the center in the affairs of states has led to regional feelings. Further, demand for autonomy has also been raised by regions within some states of Indian Federation. Best example is demand for separate statehood like demand for Bodoland, Gorkha land, Vidharpa, Talangana, etc. Also demand for full-fledged statehood like in case of Delhi, many of you might have read many newspaper articles related to tug of war between central government and Delhi government. Another example is demand for autonomy 
like in Kashmir by national conference. So these are the examples of region demanding greater autonomy. Now let us see another form of regionalism that is secession from the union. And this is the dangerous form of regionalism. Why? Because it emerges when state demands separation from the center and try to establish an independent identity of their own. For example, Manipur, Mizoram and Tripura. Now having seen the forms of regionalism, further let us look into the causes of regionalism. First and the causes of regionalism is geographical factors. Now as you know, India has a diverse geographical landmass. Thus, there is a huge variation in climate and these differences in climate cause changes in lifestyle and food habits. For example, North India is very cold during winter and very hot during summer. But this is not the case in South India which is hot and humid year-round. People's clothing and lifestyle are varied due to this fact. Also, people living in forests like tribes depend on forests for food, shelter and other needs. Thus, they have lifestyle that is significantly different from the rest of the population. So these differences trigger the cause of regionalism. Next is linguistic factor. Now as you know India has 22 official language that is recognized by constitution but there are around 1635 mother tongues as per 2001 census. Now language is an important factor of integrating people and emotional attachments are developed. Consequently demand of linguistic states started. Example is South Indian states like Tamil Nadu. Next is religion. It is also one of the major factors of regionalism. For example, coming back to our main topic today, violent demand for an independent country of Khalistan was based on Sikh religion. Next is regional culture or ethnicity. You should know that India is home to as many as 645 scheduled tribes as recognized by the constitution. These ethnic differences form base for demands for political autonomy. For example, Nagas of Nagaland are demanding a nation based on their ethnic identity. Here, this you can connect with a violent protest in Manipur which is based on the sea. Next cause is economic backwardness. Economic backwardness is one of major triggering cause of regionalism. It is a zero-sum game. One side prosperity is proportional to another region's poverty and it fuels regional sentiment. For example, formation of states like Jharkhand and Telangana were based on lack of development. Next is lower level of infrastructural facilities. Lower level of infrastructural development such as power, distribution, irrigation facilities, roads, modern markets for agricultural produce has been on backstage. For example, Vidarbha region in Maharashtra. Next cause is political and administration failure. This is a source of tension and gives birth to sub-regional movements for separate state. For example, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand and recently Telangana. Even now, many of you would have heard about such demands from Vidarbha, Harit Pradesh, UP, Kongo Nadu, Tamil Nadu. These demands based on political and administration failure. Next is son of the soil mentality. Now what is this mentality? A state specifically belongs to main linguistic groups. Inhabiting it or that state constitutes exclusive homeland of its main language speakers who are son of the soil or residents. This feeling together with lack of adequate employment opportunity and economic well-being forms son of the soil mentality. Best example is violent protests in Mumbai led by Shiv Sena against North Indians and South Indians. Another cause is rise of political parties with a regional agenda. Now regional forces aimed at securing interest of region and promoting minority interests further gives the idea of regionalism. For example, Jharkhand Mukti Morcha, SAD, etc. belongs to this category of the regional political parties. Now these causes creates the emotional field for regionalism. It further have far-reaching impacts in the unity of our country. So in this context, let us understand important impacts of regionalism. So first and a positive impact is positive role in nation building. If demand of a region are accommodated by political system of country, 
people of that region feel empowered and closer to the larger nation for example telangana the protest for a separate state has been stopped after the creation of a new state second under positive impact is it strengthened representative democracy now regionalism has a democratizing effect as it helps people feel more involved in institution of local and regional governance for example after creation of chatisgarh direct democracy tools like right to recall has been employed at the local level next and the positive impact is balance regional development by raising voices and by working together towards upliftment of their region thereby overcoming development imbalances for example one of the main demands for the creation of jharkhand and chatisgarh was imbalanced regional development Now, having seen the positive impacts, let's see few important negative impacts also. First, in this is internal security challenges. Secessionist form of regionalism, like Khalistan movement, is a serious threat to development, progress, and unity of nation. Next is politics of vote bank, which is based on language, culture, and that is certainly against healthy democratic procedures. Next is hurdles in international diplomacy. Sometimes regionalism creates pressure in international democracy. Best example is West Bengal opposed Tiska River Water Sharing Treaty with Bangladesh. So we can see how regionalism can create hurdles in international diplomacy. Next is it negatively impacts economic growth. How negative? As regionalism induced violence, disturbs society, school colleges, tourism, and government need to deploy extra forces to control the situation. For example, son of soil protest in Mumbai. Now, having seen forms of regionalism and important causes of regionalism and its positive and negative impacts, now let's see what steps can be taken to mitigate some of the worst effects of regionalism. Now, first step is that political parties should try to avoid partisanship. Appeals made to electorate based on regional identity must be stopped. they should aim at bringing a national unity besides all sectarian interests second way forward is doing away with the regional imbalance and what is required uniform economic development especially of under development backward and naxal hit areas like sukma dantewada etc so development of these areas should be a priority to avoid discontent of people another step is to promote cultural sensitization programs these programs must be taken up in colleges to avoid hatred based on regions and promote friendship among students for example ek bharat shreshth bharat kashi tamil sangam another step is to promote national identity through use of sporting events like cricket hockey to bolster the sense of unity and brotherhood in the country the next is to promote national integration council role of national integration council must be revamped to solve conflicting regional aspirations so overall providing a level playing field for all citizens and adhering to the principles of fundamental rights and dpsp states can avoid the new demands of regionalism to a great extent now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 14 in the hindu newspaper context of this article is that contrary to its previous claim that manual scavenging had been eliminated in the country and the only remaining threat was the hazardous cleaning of sewers and septic tanks the union social justice and empowerment ministry has now said that only 508 of the 766 districts in the country have been declared free of manual scavenging now as we know The problem of manual scavenging divides individuals from the very basic human rights of dignified life as enshrined in article 21 of the constitution. It also has layers which expose several structural flaws in the polity and governance of the country. Now if you can trace the GS labels, GS paper 2 clearly mentions issues related to vulnerable sections of population. So in this discussion we'll delve about questions like what defines manual scavenging what are the safeguards available why curbing manual scavenging is still prevalent then impact of manual scavenging and we'll end our discussion that what should be done 
So now let's start our discussion with the definition of manual scavenger. Now as per prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and the Rehabilitation Act 2013, manual scavenger means a person engaged or employed by an individual or a local authority or any agency for manually cleaning, carrying, disposing of or otherwise handling in any manner human excreta in an insanitary toilet or in an open brain etc. So this is what manual scavenger means according to this act. Now international labor organizations have segregated manual scavenging into three different parts. First, removal of human dung from dry toilets. Second, cleaning and washing of septic tanks. And third, cleaning and washing of gutters and sewers. Now before moving to legal safeguards in India, let's see status of manual scavenging in India. As per the reply of Minister of State for Social Justice and Empowerment in Rajya Sabha, at least 308 individuals have died while cleaning sewers and septic tanks in the past five years, that is from 2018 to 2022, of which 52 are from Tamil Nadu and 46 from Uttar Pradesh, 40 from Haryana and 38 from Maharashtra and 33 from Delhi. Now the actual figure could be a higher since FIRs are not registered in many cases. So now let's discuss legal safeguards in India with respect to manual scavenging. First and this is Protection of Civil Rights Act 1955. Now based on Article 17 to abolish the practice of untouchability against scheduled caste Dalits, government enacted Protection of Civil Rights Act 1955. Basically, it punishes the preaching and practice of untouchability and enforcement of any disability against any member of the society. Second is Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes, Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989. Government enacted this act to prevent commission of offences against members of Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes and also to provide relief and rehabilitation of victims of such offences. Next is Employment of Manual Scavengers and Construction of Dry Latrines Prohibition Act 1993. Now, this act prohibits the employment of manual scavengers, manual cleaning of sewers and septic tanks without protective equipment. Basically, it seeks to rehabilitate manual scavengers and provide for their alternative employment. According to this act, each local authority, cantonment board and railway authority is responsible for serving insanitary toilets within its jurisdiction. The next is National Commission for Safai Karamcharis Act 1993. This act established National Commission for Safai Karamcharis with power to investigate grievances and take suo moto notice of matters relating to sanitary workers. However, the Act lapsed in year 2004 and now National Commission for Safai Karamchari is functioning as non-statutory body of the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment whose tenure is extended from time to time through government resolutions. Cabinet has extended the term of National Commission for Safai Karamchari till year 2025. Now having seen the legal safeguards in India, let's discuss reason behind its prevalence. Now first reason behind its prevalence is poor enforcement of acts and policies. Just now we have seen several acts are there to prevent manual scavenging. But still they have failed to remove the problem of manual scavenging due to their lackluster implementation. What is that? Poor coordination among departments, lack of general public empathy, and lack of political will have resulted into poor accountability and continuation of this problem as suggested by the death figures. Another reason is caste system as manual scavenging has remained closely attached or associated with the age-long feature of caste system in India. It is presumed as a work of the people belonging to so-called lower caste or class of the society. Furthermore, 
focus on financial aspect of rehabilitation have failed to mend the underlying social causes like caste prejudices associated with the job this can be understood by the fact that more than 90% of the people engaged in such jobs are dalits so here you can see the correlation between caste system and manual scavenging next is low level of technological intervention poor sewage treatment apparatus in urban and rural areas have given scope for further engagement of the people in such jobs especially several urban areas are still struggling to handle the sewage produced and most of which is being discharged untreated thus giving scope to general masses for engaging person in manual scavenging the next is lack of alternative career options age old stigma attached to person associated with such jobs coupled with poor education deprive them from any other meaningful job opportunities thus leaving them with no or little option next is prevalence of dry toilets both urban and rural landscape lack the water borne toilets moreover people in rural areas still prefer open fields as toilets recent study highlights that there are more than 20 million in sanitary toilets in india and such practices adds to the prevalence of manual scavenging in india so these are the important reasons behind prevalence of manual scavenging in india now let's see important impacts of manual scavenging first is poverty a sanitation worker works throughout their lives with very low wages most of them are manipulated and treated into work with low wages or else job will be given to anyone else now most of them are not aware of employment laws remuneration laws etc so they work on contract basis but they can't even understand the basic terms of a contract thus this vicious cycle of poverty continues through generations next is health issues abundant of diseases they face during life span like various injuries social anxiety infections are not surprising for this class operating in dust and germs from the garbage damages their health a lot average life expectancy of a sanitation worker is only 50 year old workers and their family face many diseases throughout their lives last but not the least is social discrimination in spite of working so hard for the society they face discrimination at all levels of life cycle they face a lot of social discrimination because of their work and caste they are often seen as untouchables or impure in caste based society leading to their exclusion from social economic and educational opportunities and this stigma affects their self esteem and psychological well being perpetuating a cycle of marginalization and poverty so these are the important impacts of manual scavenging now having seen the reason behind its prevalence and its impact now let's see some steps which can help us to curb this practice first is promoting social awareness nagar palika ngos health officers and social communities should create awareness among the manual scavenger regarding their health issues hygienic practices and sanitization processes also small workshops events should be organized to thank this community and celebrate their honor of respect moreover the general public should be aware of legal implications regarding employment of manual scavenging next step is rehabilitation of manual scavengers it is very necessary to shift these workers to other jobs more employment should be created and this community should be prioritized when this community will be shifted towards other opportunities it will not only help to earn money but also to raise their living standard next is enforcement of laws many of the laws are being enacted to protect the sanitation worker but when it comes to implementation then these laws have failed to show results also government is reluctant to provide their promises not adequate punishments to those who are violating the rules as a result this taboo that is manual scavenging is still in practice and the lot end till laws are being implemented properly 
So what is needed? In stringent enforcement of laws should be ensured by training and sensitizing the officials entrusted with such tasks. The next use of technology. Use of technology and scientific management of waste management should be prioritized to curb the problem of manual scavenging. For example, Greater Hyderabad Municipal Corporation has forged a robot named Bunny Good to replace humans. More such technological interventions should be promoted and incentivized. Last but not least is education. Poverty associated with the scavenging results into more number of dropouts in the school. So financial assistance should be ensured to children of such families so that certain level of skill and education can be imparted to help them in grabbing alternative job opportunities. So these are the important steps with the help of which we can try to curb this problem. Now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 14. Context is that Karnataka High Court has said that doctors must strictly comply with law on reporting POXO offences. Now what is POXO? In order to effectively address the heinous crimes of sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of children through less ambiguous and more stringent legal provisions, Protection of Children from Sexual Offences, that is POCSO Act 2012, was enacted. This act aims to curb child sexual abuse by increasing penalties for sexual offences against children and creating a sensitive criminal justice system to support child victims. Now, children forms an important part of vulnerable section, which is very important under GS Paper 2. So, in this discussion, we'll see salient features of POCSO Act, status of cases under POCSO, then we'll see key challenges to the implementation of POCSO and we'll end our discussion with measures need to be taken. So let's begin our discussion with salient features of the POCSO Act. First is that Act defines a child as any person below 18 years of age. It defines different forms of sexual abuse for the first time, which includes penetrative sexual assault, sexual assault and sexual harassment. Deems a sexual assault to be aggravated under certain circumstances such as when the abused child is mentally ill or when the abuse is committed by a person in a position of trust or authority. vis vis the child like a family member, police officer, teacher or doctor. The next is person who traffic children for sexual purposes are also punishable under the provisions of this act. Next is that this act provides for establishment of special codes for trials of offences under the act. Then this act also incorporates child friendly procedures for reporting, recording of evidence, investigation and trial of offences. Then act makes it mandatory to report commission of an offence and also the recording of complaint and failure to do so would make a person liable for punishment of imprisonment. And this is under section 19. The next media has been barred from disclosing the identity of the child without the permission of the special court. Now let's see status of cases under POXO. It is imperative to note that increase in cases registered under POXO Act has been much sharper than overall crimes against children. POXO cases increased 22% in 2018 and 19 2019. Cases registered under POXO constituted 32% of the total crimes committed against children in year 2019. Uttar Pradesh and Maharashtra registered the highest number of cases under POXO with 7,594 in Uttar Pradesh and 6,558 in Maharashtra, respectively. Out of the total cases registered under POXO, 55% of cases were registered under child rape, that is Section 4 and 6 of POXO Act, Section 376 of IPC in year 2019. Among these cases, 99% of the victims were females and these percentages have remained constant since year 2017. Here you can see that under section 8 and 10 of POXO in year 2019, conviction rate is 35.1% and pendency 
percentage is 88.8 percent with this you can map that how serious this issue is now let's discuss key challenges to the implementation of poxo act first in this is legal inconsistencies now while poxo act criminalizes sexual intercourse with a woman less than 18 years of age exception to Section 375 of the IPC carved out an exception in cases where the wife was more than 15 years of age. Consequently, sexual intercourse by a man with his wife who was more than 15 years of age was not rape. So this problematic because the acts falling in this exempted category would still fall within the scope of POCSO Act, and that is less than 18 years. Next is. disclosure of identity though the act banned it there have been numerous instances where the identity of child victims has been revealed by the media or court themselves while giving verdict next is mandatory reporting provision now this provision under act proved to be counterproductive as victims of sexual abuse or their families may hesitate to approach medical professionals for fear of being drawn into a criminal case thereby negatively impacting their right to health and medical care it hinders adolescents access to safe and legal sexual and reproductive services including legal abortions and contraceptives next applicability to consensual relations in minors now poxo act made any sexual activity involving a child an offence under the act by rendering teenagers incapable of giving consent to sexual relations consensual romantic relationship between teenagers often get criminalized so most of such cases often resulted in equitable because the adolescent girl failed to testify against her sexual partner then next is delay in investigation the pendency of poxo cases is very high that we have seen in our last slide and one of the reason is slow pace of police investigations and delay in submitting the reports by forensic laboratories the next is lack of special courts in all districts though the poxo act came into force in 2012 designation of special courts as mandated by the act did not happen at the expected pace states were lagging behind in designating these courts causing the supreme court to intervene the next inadequate compensation to the victims the payment of compensation to victims under this act is complex issue why because there is often a lack of clarity on procedures for disbursing the compensation especially in cases where the child has no family support or resides in a child care institution without parental support or there is apprehension that the compensation so awarded may be misused the next is inadequate awareness about poxo act now due to inadequate awareness about poxo act some individuals may not understand the legal obligations and consequences related to child sexual abuse for instance a parent who is unaware of the act's provisions might not recognize certain behaviors as sexual abuse or fail to report incidents promptly inadvertently delaying justice for the victim and allow the perpetrator to continue their actions So these are the important challenges related to POCSO Act. Now let's see what measures can be taken in this regard. First and the foremost is awareness and education. Increase awareness about the act by including age appropriate information about POCSO in school curriculum including information on helplines like childline. Next is establish a robust and accessible system for reporting cases of child sexual abuse including dedicated helplines, online platforms and child friendly complaint mechanism. Next, ensure child friendly investigation procedures and settings where children are interviewed in a non-threatening, supportive and age appropriate manner to minimize trauma. Next, train police officers and other relevant authorities on child rights establish special units or cells within police force to deal with cases under poxo act set up more forensic laboratories while improving the capacity and infrastructure of existing one then set up dedicated special courts to expedite the trial of poxo cases 
ensuring a child friendly environment and fast track justice also stipulate a time limit for consideration of disbursement of compensation to the victim then next is ensure the confidentiality and privacy of the victim throughout the legal process including protection against public disclosure of their identity then next provide comprehensive support services including medical assistance and rehabilitation support programs for victims and their families then next appoint trained and specialized public prosecutors to handle pocso cases effectively enhance legal aid and support services for victims to ensure their rights are protected during the legal process then next is foster collaboration among various stakeholders including government agencies law enforcement child protection organizations schools ngos to coordinate efforts and share resources in implementing the pocso act effectively last but not the least appropriate amendments to the law to decriminalize adolescent sexuality now last discussion is based on this three pointer here you are provided with three statements and you have to identify which one is true and which one is false the first one is antimicrobial resistance that is amr is process by which body develops resistance against the microbial infections now this statement is false as antimicrobial resistance is the process by which infections caused by microbes become resistance to medicines that is antimicrobial treatments such as antibiotics antifungals antivirals antimalarials develop to treat them as a result traditional therapies are rendered ineffective illness persists and the risk of spreading the infection to others increases now let's come to the second statement all the un member states including india have ratified the pandemic treaty of the who now again this statement is false as in december 2021 only 194 world health organization member states agree to draft and negotiate an international pandemic instrument or treaty and it aims to strengthen and coordinate national and international efforts to prevent prepare for and respond to future pandemic emergencies now let's come to the last statement the major focus of pandemic instrument is on antimicrobial resistance now again this statement is false as concern lies in the fact that draft pandemic instrument is overly focused on viral threats and has ignored the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance and bacterial threats now why it is a cause of concern as not all pandemics in the past have been caused by virus and not all pandemics in the future will be caused by virus as plague and cholera have been devastating past pandemics due to bacteria so this treaty basically focused on virus so with this our third statement is false so here all the statements are incorrect and this pre pointer is based on this article and context of this article is that recently the latest version of draft pandemic instrument or the pandemic treaty was shared with member states at the world health assembly while earlier draft of pandemic instrument drew on guidance from amr policy researchers and civil society organizations after the closed door negotiations by member states these insertions are at risk for removal so that's all for today stay tuned for more such updates